Hello and welcome everyone. Welcome to Harmoniously Podcast. Here's Melissa. And Rachel. Happy Women's Month. Yes. So happy Women's Month. Exactly. So for this month, as on the 8th is the International Women's Day, we decided to have different episodes dedicated to women. And today we are going to discuss women's health. And Rachel is a, an expert in this field, so she will share interesting tips and interesting knowledge that she has. Um, and we can start with a, a, a rival practice as usual. So I invite all of you that who are not driving to just take a moment to relax, maybe close your eyes, and just start to focus on your breath. Allow yourself to just connect with the breath. Use the breath as a bridge to come to the present moment, to drop down into your body and arriving into this moment in time to the now and then slowly come back and open your eyes. It's nice to take a little bit of time to just breathe, mm -hmm. even though sometimes I would like just to stay longer, but <laughs> it's nice even a little breath. From time to time, everyone, I think we should just take a breath to drop in to the present. But anyway, let's go ahead with our topic for today, women's health. And yeah. we're talking about naturally born female. Is there like some specific issue um, on hormones, on like, I was actually sharing with Rachel um, that I just discovered today that my ferritin, so my iron was slow. And that's why I was feeling very exhausted. And that's something that I had uh, for many years. And sometimes I forget that my exhaustion may be caused by low iron. And that was really the issue. So, and that's a common issue, I think. I, it's super common. <laughs> <laughs> Vastly common. Um, so before I kind of begin, like I, I will at least try to qualify some of my experience. So, um, you know, some of my background was I spent a decade in critical care and emergency care, which is not really directed towards male or female. I mean, there's some unique differences, but it is very much dedicated to just keeping people very much alive. Um, when I finished some of that chapter of my life, I actually stepped into a pretty specific women's health kind of chapter for mm -hmm. about five years. So I worked very specifically with like adolescent um, reproductive age and elderly females throughout all of the kind of reproductive life challenges that we might face, but the unique kind of chemistry that we have as females. So through childbearing, but also through menstrual cycle difficulties, control, you know, birth control, um, and some of the other types of things that we see throughout the lifespan when we need to figure out when we start getting into perimenopause and menopause. And typically, you know, we have a very kind of complicated and yet simple like hormonal cycle throughout our month. A 28 day cycle is how it's based. Mm -hmm. Um, but yes, so anemia is like very high on the list of things that I would see regularly in my women's health studies. Um, it is kind of an insidious problem because it isn't always detected through just normal blood chemistry. Sometimes we need to do like more mm -hmm. specific iron studies to check this iron binding capacity, total ferritin. There are some kind of more specific labs. So for folks out there who may not you think they, you know, they got some blood work done recently and it wasn't, you know, terribly anemic. There are some really specific labs that we can do that give us a little bit more insight into determining mm -hmm. if you're truly anemic and you're low yeah. in iron. Yeah, what that's is the really important yeah. point to say, like, if I can share my story, yes, uh, if you just check iron or general test, that would never show that. But like checking ferritin, that, that's the, the mark that is always low. So definitely. And then I will feel it. That's why like I would not stop and feel it and have other symptoms. Um, mm -hmm. And that's why we, we did more thoughtful yeah. tests. Yeah, exactly. You want to look into it a little further, right? 
And lab tests can tell us a lot. They can tell us everything. But they can tell mm-hmm. us quite a bit, especially when we're looking at like iron. Um, and women in general, we tend to lose a bit of blood every month with menstrual cycles. So if you're on a traditional menstrual cycle or you have regular cycles, at least theoretically, you're losing some of your blood throughout the mm-hmm. month, which is normal and typically compensated. But we also forget that there's another way that like most of us don't absorb iron very well. Iron is um, a little bit more complicated and many of us eat, you know, meat free diets. We're not eating a ton of animal proteins and animal irons, which is a really great source of iron. There are some other ways. So, you know, we have two issues. We have blood loss, so we're losing iron and blood volume but also that we may not be getting adequate amounts from diet. So, and there could Mm -hmm. be both, right? Like you could be, you know, it could be a little bit of each. So I think it's important when we think about this, that there isn't just one way to solve things, right? And especially as women, we might have heavier cycles. There can be lots of reasons that we might be having heavier cycles, heavier menstrual flow, which can result in additional blood volume losses. There are Mm -hmm. some other reasons too, right? A big surgery, we had massive bleeding from something going on. Um, gut issues for even less absorption of iron. So there's a ton of things that could be impacting our ability to take in iron. The most simple way that we typically address anemia or iron deficient anemia is because there are a couple of different types types of anemia as well. So let's, I'll try not Hmm. to confuse those as well. You can have lots of different types of anemia. Iron deficient Mm -hmm. anemia is the most common and we see it pretty often in our, our female grouping. Um, But there are a few ways that let's just say we did get this worked up. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it was interesting, Mel, like I'll revisit your story a little bit. Like Mel was sharing with me that she was feeling, do you want to say it? Like you were feeling a little tired and maybe thought Mm -hmm. you had a bias and tell me how that felt for you. Yeah. So I just started feeling exhausted and then it was just like, uh, well, the following day, even more exhausting, more exhausting and didn't matter how much I would sleep. Uh, or even like take a nap or like I would wake up tired and then do a couple of things and then need need a nap is again and then just like dragging around the whole day and it was just getting worse instead of getting better with okay allow myself to rest yeah yeah and I think that's probably the most common symptom is that a lot mm-hmm. of women are feeling really tired <laughs> Which yeah, makes that's... sense. I think we're all doing quite a bit and, you know, it could be a million different things, right? Stress, like a sleep, maybe I am getting sick, but mm-hmm. I think we went to do this beautiful act of giving blood and they wanted to be yes. thorough and checked initially to see mm-hmm. you know, that you were a candidate and that everything was okay for you to donate. And they determined like, oh, by the way, you also seem like you're a little low in iron, which has mm-hmm. been a known issue for you. And this is yeah. one of the ways that we often figure this out. Um, we also may figure it out in early pregnancy. We might do some more comprehensive labs. We might figure it out, um, when we're looking for something else going on with female reproductive health, um, in some of those additional lab chemistries. It is very common for pregnant women to also be low in iron. Um, they're making about 25% more circulating blood volume. So they need to have more iron to help those hemoglobin cells. So there are a lot of reasons why this happens, but a lot of women report that they feel tired. Um, I've had girls report that they actually end up feeling short of breath as well because they're mm. actually having to breathe more. They're, you know, iron is yeah. uh, part of our hemoglobin, which helps bind oxygen and carry it to all our cells. So it's got a pretty important role. But we can actually get so low that we start to be very symptomatic. We can start to have more chest pain. We can start mm-hmm. to have shortness of breath. We can be very fatigued, very tired, bruise easily. There's all kinds of things that can occur. But when we talk about the ways that we can bring back up our iron stores, right? And this is kind of specific because not all people can tolerate iron supplements. And there are some traditional like prescription and or over-the-counter supplements that we recommend. Um, I generally recommend, obviously, we want to address food sources because that's one way. So when we think about foods that can increase iron stores, um, you know, yes, meat, poultry, fish can be at the top of the list for those of us that do um, have meat in our diets, eggs. So there is some of the dairy category or um, the other categories, but beans, peas, lentils also have a pretty rich iron content. So tofu. So those are some alternatives Mm. for folks in a meat-free diet. 
um, dark leafies and dark vegetables like beets, beets, uh, spinach, dark leafies can be very beneficial in increasing our iron stores. Um, whole grains, a bit of a mixed opinion on whole grains in general as some of our grains, especially in, at least in North America are heavily polluted with like endocrine disruptors. So I'm not always first to go to like a whole grain category. Mm -hmm. um, dried fruits can be another one though. So dried fruits, I used to recommend like dried apricots, raisins, things like that. Mm -hmm. Nuts and seeds tend to also have a pretty good iron content to them and a little bit more tolerable. I used to tell my pregnant moms, like take dried fruit with you and like have snacks in the car. As a sidebar, there are some dried fruits that have some chemicals that they use to um, dry them with that can be very upsetting to the stomach. So like I can't eat half of them because they upset my stomach. So just being aware of like yeah. what works for you and what kinds of foods you can tolerate because food mm -hmm. sources are a great way to start, right? We want to increase through, you know, making sure we're getting good dietary sources of this. Um, we also want to make sure our gut is in good health. So, and we may need to add in something like probiotics to make sure we're absorbing well, mm -hmm. something to make sure that we're more balanced there. Um, and then I think, you know, when we talk about like the traditional supplements for iron for my gals that are really low, I'm often recommending three times a day iron supplementation, which is a lot of iron. And I think we should talk about that iron can be a little bit disruptive to the GI system. Iron in general is kind of um, not the funnest supplement to take. It can be really constipating. It can cause mm -hmm. nausea. It can be um, a little GI upsetting. So a lot of girls don't love taking iron supplements and they'll try with food sources first, but often if we really are quite depleted, we really need to get back up mm -hmm. and take a supplement. Um, how was your experience? Have you, you said you had found a good supplement that you enjoyed and like, did it cause you any side effects? Yeah. Did you notice anything? Mm. It did not. No, I actually tolerate it very well. So um, I'm very grateful because uh, uh, for some reason from food, I don't absorb it that well. So yeah. it's still, this depletion of iron still happens. Even if I do, I don't eat meat, but I do eat like leaf, like as I said, dark leafy greens, um, mm -hmm. dry, dry fruits and all the other like mm, lentils. Actually, I had been eating lentils last week quite yeah. many of of them so yeah, yeah. so it, it yeah. didn't work um mine and i know it's a good combination also has uh, vitamin c and folate i think that goes well together yeah. mm -hmm. absolutely and that was my next recommendation is that like taking iron with vitamin c actually increases the amount of iron absorption we get so Taking your iron supplement with like a little glass of OJ or strawberries or citrus fruit or something like that can really help it being mm -hmm. more readily absorbed in the GI system. So it's often the case that we recommend this or the supplement will come with a vitamin C built in mm -hmm. to kind of absorption. Um, timing of iron supplementation as well. So in general, you know, I've had girls take iron i mentioned up to three times a day and like divided mm -hmm. doses like once in the morning once in the afternoon once in the evening that can be a great way to get like a consistent amount of iron absorption they've done some studies that have shown that like we don't really absorb iron that well especially in supplementation so yes adding in vitamin c can help but there was also an interesting study that talked a little bit about supplementations done every other day so mm -hmm. especially because this can be a bit of a agent that's tough on our stomach or be really constipating is something that sometimes I would have my girls try every other day because it can produce um, a type of chemical reaction. So it's serum hepcidin that persists for about 24 hours. So it basically blocks the rest of iron absorption for another 24 hours. When we mm -hmm. do this and then we take our supplement, you know, every other day, we're actually maximizing the absorption of iron. There are some girls that still need to be taking this routinely for different reasons. Their iron levels may be particularly low. They're in a state of pregnancy, et cetera. But in general, a lot of folks find that they're able to absorb it better and also tolerate it better when we take it every other day. It's just a matter of remembering that, right? Because mm. once we get out of the habit or like, did I take it yesterday? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
So trying to remember to take your supplement and using it every other day may be a great option mm. for some folks. Mm. Well, um, they can use those like boxes with the uh, with yeah. um week. I mean, the day of the week. Yeah, totally. So that could be easier to remember. Totally. Than... remember. Yeah, <laughs> totally. That's another way to like you know set a reminder. Um, some people say set it by something that you do every day, like your toothbrush, and you know flip one tab up if you did it today or whatever. So there's lots of really great ways to remember to do this type of thing. Same thing with like your multivites or whatever you might be taking daily or mm -hmm. other supplements. But I think iron deficiency anemia is often one of those things that we see so often throughout the reproductive life cycle that it is worth mentioning as something. Yes. A, we need proper diagnosis. Don't just assume you're anemic because oftentimes mm -hmm. there may be something else going on that isn't iron deficiency mm -hmm. anemia. And iron isn't a great supplement to take if you don't need it. So keeping that in mind, yes, you might be tired. You might have a little something else going mm -hmm. on. So get it looked up, see your, you know, annual provider, see your uh, women's health provider, whoever you might see, but don't just assume you have iron deficiency anemia. Not everybody that has a cycle simply has iron deficiency anemia because they're bleeding monthly. Many people do not mm -hmm. have this and they're probably is some genetic issues here as well. Like some of us absorb better than others. Some of us maintain mm -hmm. better than others just from other underlying reasons. So don't assume yeah. anything, but for girls that have had this or chronically in, you know, have this condition, there are some great ways to kind of resupplement and ways to get better absorption out of it. And if you have GI distress with taking your iron supplements, um, I usually recommend colace or something that's non-stimulant to help with like constipation issues. Obviously you mm -hmm. can use things prunes, um, other food sources to help things mm. move through. Magnesium supplements can be great here. Um, the kinds like magnesium citrate, magnesium oxidated magnesium can be great to help with constipation. So lots of other really natural ways we can deal with side effects from these types of medicines. And I think like you, Mel, to bring it back to like your point is that you found a supplement that worked really well for you. Mm -hmm. So always kind of because they can be expensive, trying to find a supplement that works best for yes. you, works with your body, right? Right, yeah, yeah, totally. But you have to try also. It, it's yeah. hard to, <laughs> you need to experiment and see which one. And I did notice with iron, it's, or at least because I have more of a de deficiency of iron than any other elements, mm -hmm. I noticed that it was particularly hard to find a supplement that would work. Like I did yeah. have to try many before yeah. finding um a composition that would work with my system yeah and mm. i think that's important to say because like it's also the reason i'm not going to sit here and list like the my top three supplements because honestly i find that a lot of these types of supplements work differently in each of our bodies um it's unfortunate because i wish there was like i'd be like take this one and it works awesome but it isn't mm -hmm. always that way. Sometimes we have to trial and error a few things to see what's working well with our body chemistry, you know, our timing, um, and you know, how our, our composition is working best on its own. So I think it is worth trying a few different things. And I think it does make sense. I think if you're mm -hmm. going to supplement, you also need to make sure you're having good follow-up, right? Don't just supplement endlessly thinking like you need all this additional iron when you may not, or you may have built up your stores again and be in, you know, the green zone. So it is worth following up and a reasonable follow-up level for those that are terribly low would be six to 12 weeks later, we're following up again with our provider, maybe having some additional labs followed up, say, Hey, we're back in the green zone. We can slow down the supplementation. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes I would have girls switch from daily or every other day to like once a week supplementation twice a week supplementation. So there are a lot of different ways to kind of continue this without it being so regimented. So I think that's yeah. worth mentioning is if you're going to, yeah. if you have this type of condition, you want to make sure that what you're doing is making an impact, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. And it makes also sense that once you are in a good space, you don't want to continue to do it daily if, in case it's not necessary. Uh, it's, it's good yeah. to know. It's good to know. Yeah. Maybe at that point, food reserves food resource will be enough to yeah. cover the, iron, exactly. the daily iron need but exactly. if there's a point in which is you're depleted you need supplements but then not not all the time yeah. mm -hmm. exactly exactly and if we are chronically low and we're not building up stores it is indicative that there could be something more going on that does need further evaluation right mm -hmm. folks end up with 
like GI little small leaks or other kinds of things. There can be a million reasons why we might be losing our iron stores and not being able to build them up properly. So it's important that we do have good follow-up. This is not blanket statement to like all people and all iron supplementation. These are kind of talking about these broad overviews of like things that might be more specific to women and women's health in general and things that we mm -hmm. see so frequently and just little tips and things that might be able to help. Mm -hmm. For sure. And also on that note, what else is another common uh, female issue? Yeah, totally. So I don't know that it's necessarily more female dominant, but I will say something that I, I did see quite a bit of were headaches and migraines, right? Mm. So a lot of us may have hormone driven headaches or migraines, right? So there are specific conditions here that can relate to driving migraines. Um, my oldest daughter is 25 and she has had chronic migraines since she was eight years old, which is pretty young to develop uh, you know, migraine syndrome. I had the same, but okay. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's yeah. fairly unique, but it does, it does occur. Mm -hmm. Um, again, same type of disclaimer, like you always want to make sure you're ruling out other reasons, right? That we're mm -hmm. getting migraines or frequent headaches. And I think there's a lot to say about some of the newer generation medications that we have to treat migraines. Um, I think she's tried every single drug on the market out there. So all the tryptins, all the other types of medicines that we use, prophylactic medications like um, topiramate or topamax, um, nothing ever really provided a of relief for her and she gets really debilitating migraines and I've seen this mm. in my patient population time and time again um, where they're debilitating we might be losing you know two or three work days a month for migraines mm -hmm. and it's especially if they're secular like we're having cycle related or cycle informed headaches now I'm speaking to migraines but there could also be tension or cluster headaches that are going on something like that but ultimately, they can all be kind of triggered by hormones. And our hormones mm -hmm. fluctuate all month long, right? They kind of follow a very specific cadence and estrogen and progesterone and FSH and all, all these beautiful hormones are doing this beautiful dance all like month long. And ultimately, it can trigger some migraines for some of us. So I think that's one important category is kind of mm -hmm. knowing what our triggers are, right? Like a lot of us, when we're sleep deprived, we'll start to get more headaches. Mm -hmm. A lot of us may have it in the week preceding our cycle. So that like kind of alteration in our, our hormone cycling right before we start shedding mm -hmm. can be a bit of a trigger for some of us. So acknowledging that those days are more, yeah. you know. I mean, that's cool. also, if you said like if you're sleep deprived before our period, we also need more sleep. So if we try to fit in the same amount of sleep at the end, we are also sleep deprived, I feel. Yep, totally. Mm -hmm. Well, and a lot of us get this, you know, um, you know, the way our hormones shift throughout the month, a lot of us are sleep deprived right before our cycle because our progesterone is doing funny stuff and our estrogen is <laughs> dancing. A lot of us do sleep a little worse right before our cycles. Mm -hmm. It's really common, right? Mm -hmm. um, so having said that, like we have this kind of perfect storm to create and we also might be a little more angsty, right? Some of us do have like true PMS symptoms or a little bit more volatility. There are conditions such as PMDD, which is premenstrual dysphoric disorder, which is, you know, in the DSM-5, it is a, um, a fairly significant alteration in our moods during that few days prior to our cycle. Mm. So when we have more stress, perhaps, we have less sleep, perhaps. So all of these things can be this perfect storm to creating, you know, migraines. Um, I, I definitely think there's something to be said in the value of finding like the types of rescue meds that work well for you. Um, there's a lot of newer generation meds out there that do a great job. The injectables once monthly, some are infusions. Um, I think some people still get great results from the tryptin category, like the rescue meds that you take as your headaches are coming on. I think there are something to the prophylactics. Uh, some folks definitely take prophylactics once monthly, um, topiramate finding the medications that work well for you. And there are headache specialists. There are neurologists that specialize in headaches. So like if you really have like severe headaches, getting that mm -hmm. evaluated by someone proper is crucial. But if we're talking about the general public, like for me, I get a migraine three to five times a year. Um, when I look back on it, I'm always like, oh, I was really stressed out. I haven't been sleeping well. Maybe I was fighting it. Whatever. It's always some perfect storm. Mm -hmm. 
things that I do think can help, especially as daily supplementation that help with other types of things, mm -hmm. um, definitely omega-3s. So when we talk about omega-3s, I just read a study recently and I couldn't find it to reference for this, but I, I will. Ultimately, we're seeing that omega-3s, especially with good EPA, um, and we have like those good other acids in there, what we're seeing is that they've done a huge amount of reduction in migraines. Like they found this out incidentally. They were like, oh, we were studying something else. We realized mm. they really drastically decreased migraines, which makes mm. a ton of sense because they have some kind of anti-inflammatory properties. I will say that occasionally I will take, I take omegas every, every day, omega-3s. And I will say that it when I'm starting to feel a headache in the morning, even if it's not headed towards migraine territory, I'll take my omega-3s a little earlier. So a good quality omega-3 can be a good supplement to add in that certainly isn't likely to cause any harm and is likely to cause some benefit. So that's kind of the way we always weigh that out. Mm. Omega-3s are also found in like fatty fish. So like getting mm -hmm. salmon times a week, right? Getting um, other types of fatty fish mackerel. I'm not, I'm not a mackerel fan, but like for a for y'all out there that love it, by all means. <laughs> but the other types of food sources for um, omega-3s are actually usually found in those fatty fishes and a few other places. But I supplement because I don't get enough of that. Um, find yourself a good quality supplement. Um, do You can use fish oils as well, but I do recommend mm -hmm. quality one. Do your research. Same type of thing, right? Use high quality supplements. The best way to find high quality supplements is making sure that they're third party lab tested, which means that it, all of their results and data isn't just from the company that created them, but an outside lab has also evaluated them randomly at times and said, yes, these qualities or these um, products are, have quality and are pure and are what they say they are. But in general, using this daily. So when we take an omega, the other important factor is that we want to take it with fat. It needs fat to be absorbed. So mm -hmm. like for me, I don't eat a whole lot in the morning. So I usually take it with a few spoonfuls of like Greek yogurt or okay. some banana. Um, mm -hmm. You don't have to have a ton, but you want to have fat on board in order for this to be absorbed. So buttered toast, mm -hmm. cottage cheese. If you're not doing dairy, like even the other types of like um, mm -hmm. plant-based yogurts can work here. But just something with a little bit of fat to help it absorb. It is well absorbed. It helps it cross that gut barrier with the fat. So it gives it a mm -hmm. transport. Um, a lot of people okay. miss that and they take it and they're not getting nearly as much out of mm. it. So omega-3s can be a great way to kind of help thwart um, headache cycles. Also helps with a lot of our other neurotransmitters, which do contribute to some of other symptoms of PMS, PMDD, just as our hormones fluctuate throughout the month. Mm -hmm. So an omega may also have some background help with some of that, like other types of symptoms that we get that are more mood-based. So again, across the board, omega threes are on my foundational list of like basic supplements we should all mm -hmm. probably be eating. So kind of carte yeah. blanche omegas. Perfect. Um, my last little supplement I love for migraines is a magnesium. Um, okay. I love. I think I'm having a secret love affair with magnesium. Like magnesium probably is my favorite supplement. It's just really, it's just fantastic. It's a really great, okay. great supplement, and. What most people don't know is that there's like a ton of different types of magnesium. There's like magnesium yeah. citrate, magnesium taurate, magnesium L3-inate, magnesium glycine, uh -huh. magnesium biglycinate. There's so many different types of magnesiums and you don't need all of them, but there are some specific benefits to each one. So most folks hear, oh, I should take magnesium. They go out and they buy a magnesium supplement mm -hmm. and they buy like mag citrate or um, magnesium sulfate. And what they don't realize is that they're getting a supplement that's particularly good at relieving constipation and not really a lot mm. else. So from, from here, I'll kind of describe what I like in magnesium supplements. Mm -hmm. I would always follow the manufacturer's recommendation, again, using a quality supplement because some of the magnesium amounts, made bottle recommendations may be, there are cases I recommend a little more, a little less. But, um, so magnesium glycine or biglycinate is an excellent magnesium for mood support. So I use this in ADHD. I use it in anxiety. I use it in depression, which may relate to your cycles, but not as much to headaches. 
The magnesium we actually see working really effectively is magtorate. Magtorate is a, another type of magnesium that is more specifically shown to help improve headaches and migraine quality. So taking this as a daily supplement is totally fine. Also using it, I wouldn't necessarily recommend using it as a rescue med, but using it as a form of magnesium that you would take if you felt a headache. I do this all the time, and I do find mm. that it works so effectively for my headaches. Hmm. Um, so magnesium taurate, I think magnesium glycate uh, can be very valuable. And I do think that there's something to, there's another form of magnesium I was just trying to think. It's magnesium malate, which is also another form of magnesium that's used in like chronic fatigue when we're really tired. Um, this can help, but it also can help with some of the sleep foundation. So some of this may be valuable as well. I use like a tri-mag blend that has like mag 3 and 8, mag tori, and mag glycinate. And it's fantastic. But find something that's working for you. But overall, magnesium is not something that we get usually too much of in our dietary mm -hmm. sources. And again, something that is usually one of those really good overall supplements makes it on my foundational, like top three supplements for everyone overall, because it tends to work on a lot of really great areas and headaches tend to be one that are so common for women, especially with cyclical changes throughout the month. Yeah. And that was going to be our next topic, uh, our moon period, yeah. because there are so many different, uh, and so we were saying how in our Western society, modern society, there is not much space for these changes. But as women, we totally feel the difference. Um, in one phase, we are we have more energy, we're more creative. Uh, in another phase, we're just more tired. We create, we have more cravings, uh, mm -hmm. and 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 so on. Or even worse, like PMS. Like if we get irritated, there's a lot of changes. Yeah. And it's um, that are not easy to deal with, uh, especially in a society that does not welcome any of these changes. Like uh, there is a before our period, we're more we need to sleep more, we're more tired. Yeah. But life requires to be twenty four seven on the same energy level, which is more of a masculine quality, yes. uh, or like testosterone quality but we don't produce the same amount of hormones throughout the whole cycle. And, and probably I'm not the only one that experienced this, but at the same time, never really dig into the, var the, dif the differences. Like yeah. I did check a little bit, but I never, never explore so much of, of this. And it would be very interesting to know more uh, yeah. on your knowledge about all the yeah. different phases. Oh, it's fascinating. I mean, this is like one of those things that like really can rub all you for sure. And I think even people that are, you know, a lot of us, even in reproductive health, so like in women's health specifically, I would even refer out to like endocrinology. I'd be like, oh, that one's too complicated. Like there's so literally so much going on in our hormones and like yeah. what initiate what change and having even one small issue and one small hormone sets up this cascade of other issues with other hormones. So like in general, we're just this like perfect dance of mm -hmm. perfect hormones doing what they should be doing. But all it takes is one little thing to kind of uproot the cycle and cause, you know, disruption in it. But if we're thinking about like the overview, right? Like traditionally speaking, the women's cycle is based on a 28 day cycle. It's based on the lunar mm -hmm. cycle, right? So we do follow this kind of lunar cycling. It is based on some complex interplay of like certain hormones spike, but it causes other hormones to decrease that causes all the different phases of our cycle, right? So traditionally we have like our menstruation, we have our follicular phase, we have our luteal phase. There's a few little phases in between, but generally what we're seeing is kind of estrogen and progesterone kind of juxtapositioning throughout the month. In the second half of our cycle, more of that luteal phase, we have this small rise. Well, it could be big too. We have a big rise in progesterone. And this is usually what causes some of the issues we see with like some girls have a little bit of like constipation prior to their cycle. We have a little mood stuff, might get a little breakout. Like this is usually that mm -hmm. kind of what's happening hormonally. Um, we also might see things like that 
more irritability, definitely being more present. And then as we start to move into menstruation, we start to see estrogen and progesterone plummet. So yes, when we think about like, and I love this idea of like, you know, in our tribal cultures, we often would have mm -hmm. women would go bleed together. Like it was a mm -hmm. whole monthly re retreat we would move to, right? Like mm -hmm. this wasn't to remove women from men. It was to give women what women needed, right? They were like, yeah, to be together, to be amongst, you know, other women that may understand what they're going through, maybe off be able to offer support um, and also have this time of their month, right? Which is this mm -hmm. very beautiful part of our cycle. And I think in some of our, you know, present day societies has kind of been, there's a bit of a negative connotation around like menstruation yes. and bleeding, right? I feel like there's a negative yeah. context to it sometimes. Like it's not this beautiful, appropriate part of our cycle. It's a mm -hmm. nuisance. It's bothersome. It's, yes. Right. Which is that very kind of. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. It's a nuisance. It's something that um, yeah. impedes you to do things or it's something disgusting yeah. or, no. and also like uh, one thing that I, I never like is like when you are, maybe if you're more irritated before your period or if you're nervous and you, sh you are sharing those emotions, they're yeah. dismissed because, oh, you're just PMSing. You're yeah. Yeah. You're, you're, and it's, it's a weakness rather than a strength. Yes. Yeah, yeah, so it's just dismissed um, and or even worse, like seen as, as, I said, as you said, nuisance or something disgusting. And yes, yeah, yeah. really sad because it's a beautiful, actually, cycle that we're going through. We're connecting to the moon yeah. cycle. And exactly. by the way, about that, I would like also to ask you, because I noticed there's like pretty much half of the female population menstruate on the full moon and the other mm -hmm. half on the new moon. So it's really connected to the moon, um, mm -hmm. to my experience. But um, yep. you probably know more about that. Yeah. yeah. In natural organic cycles, oddly enough, it is typically associated more often with the full moon, but can be with the new moon. We do tend to cycle sync, all true. Like we absolutely, our body's chemistry will sync up with other females' chemistry. Mm -hmm. It's a known fact. We absolutely do it. Um, I think there's also something to the way we sync with nail counterparts as well, because they start to have like a similar cycling, even though it's not menstruation and the same we are going through, they also can sync with us in a different way. Hmm. Um, but yes, so we do tend to in non-altered cycles. So those that might be on birth control or other types of methods to control their hormones or cycling probably aren't seeing this as often and we're not as apt to cycle sync because our our cycles are being kind of manipulated by mm -hmm. another method but those gals that are not on you know form of hormone therapy or hormonal birth control typically will start to see this type of trend in their cycles i was always a full mooner so it just it was the way my cycles were always um and then my gals and i and there's also something to that right like in the er we used to have um Anyone that's worked in a hospital will tell you, like, the full moon is legit. Like, there is something to it that's otherworldly, like, just the weirdest stuff happens, the most kind of angsty. But we see that every month in our own cycles, right? Like, it mm -hmm. is this time of kind of rebirth and regeneration. It also is this time that we need to release and let go, right? So we think about that from a, a, the standpoint of, like, what's physiologically happening is that, you know, the uterine wall is basically shedding mm -hmm. this beautiful, rich, nutrient-dense garden that it has built up to plan every single month for a pregnancy that probably won't occur. And then it goes, oh, I grew this beautiful garden. And then it ultimately sheds away each month and renews, which mm -hmm. is really this incredibly beautiful kind of metaphor, but also like real physiologic practice that's happening in our bodies every month. And then rather than look at it like mystified and like this beautiful enigma that's occurring, we're like annoyed by it, right? We're like, oh, mm -hmm. it's another period and you're emotional and you're bleeding and it's this whole thing. Well, it can be a really beautiful part of it. I think that's part of what I want to share here is like moving more into that feminine energy about this rather mm -hmm. than looking at this from a very you know masculine or kind of male dominant view. Like the female view of this historically from matriarchal societies, Celtic societies, from tribal cultures has always been that like, this is a beautiful ritual of mm -hmm. each month right? 
this whole month time period. And typically it was seven days. And most women's menstrual cycle lasts somewhere between five to 10 days. But the bulk majority of that was spent in relaxation. I mean, I'll ask you now, Mel, speak to the way that we deal with this in yoga and traditional yoga philosophy. What do we do during the female cycle? What is different about that in our yoga practice that might be mm -hmm. um, altered? Yeah, there are some, depending on the tradition of yoga, mm -hmm. but there are some poses. There's mostly some poses that are not done. But yeah. I, for my knowledge, I've heard of or seen more differences um, during period in like, as you said, tribal, like for example, mm -hmm. uh, in the, in the Amazon, uh, mm -hmm. if you're doing like, depending on the tribe, some mm -hmm. women, women may not be able to join an ayahuasca ceremony during menstrual yeah. cycle, or like uh, they could not, or they cannot um, cook food for the ones that are doing a particular practice that is a, a dieta, for example. Mm -hmm. And that yeah. is not not a discrimination. But again, mm -hmm. because this energy of the menstrual period is very strong. Yeah. And there's also many other tribes that that's why um that they men would do ayahuasca or, or, or other medicine and not women originally. Like for example, that would be in, in Colombia or Brazil. Yeah. Uh, because for them it was like oh the women have already these things this ceremony they're going through every month so we men who have nothing so we can we'll, we'll do this other uh, yeah. kind of ceremony so it was always approached as um, something yes as you said as a shedding energetic mm -hmm. shedding and all yeah. that and I remember how when like in the past, I read about this in still some tribes they're doing that, that the women go on the side, right? Native Americans or other places in the world. They have like a, um, I forgot what it was. It was somewhere in Asia that they would go in this like yeah. little house by themselves. Yeah. And like the comments, the Western comment was like, oh, this discrimination. There are so yeah. um, behind and so on. They're still discriminating women. And I was like, well, why are we seeing this this way? This is yeah. a beautiful way to honor that, yes. to honor the time so that the woman can have the possibility to really um, like work those emotions that are, I think are more than just our own emotions. Yeah. I also read Eckhart Tolle, um, mm -hmm. who was saying that the period is a beautiful time in which women are also working through not only their own inner work but also ancestral work yes and so yeah. that it's that's what what yes is happening and so it's nice that is is honored in traditional yeah. tribes and not but unfortunately in in Western society, it's not. I would totally love to take, a, as you call it, a moon retreat every month yeah, <laughs> and take do. care I'm of in that. A, a retreat, sorry, can't work, like, gotta go. <laughs> but since we, in many of our cultures, and also in the spirit of equality, right, like, we are working throughout our cycles. Mm -hmm. We are still tending to our families, right? Most of us that are not living in tri tribal cultures at this moment. What else mm -hmm. could we do then to embrace, um, welcome, mm -hmm. uh, and to really honor this space of the like menstrual cycle then? Like how can we find our own kind of new age way of, um, mm -hmm. or, or modern way of approaching this with some of that ancestral lineage or that tribal culture, yeah. right? So the things I would talk to girls about are like, A, let's just start by like acknowledging that you are different than maybe your male counterpart in a biochemistry standpoint, right? Like not, but from that chemistry standpoint, you are different so that you may feel more emotional the week prior to your cycle or the week of your cycle isn't a weakness. So we have to reframe some of this, right? It isn't a detriment. It isn't a negative. It's a positive. It's a strength. Mm -hmm into what our own biochemistry is doing for us. So leaning into some of these places, right? And looking at this as a time that we might feel more connected. We might need more grounding. We might have more emotional exploration. We might have the ability to release uh, 
And this could be through menstruation, but it can also be through crying, right? And all the other forms of release. Mm -hmm. You know, I know um, I practiced Ashtanga yoga for a very long time. And I know typically in Ashtanga, we would take the week of our cycles off or the first few days of our cycles off, not the entire mm -hmm. week. Um, but we might move to more of a restorative yoga practice during that time mm -hmm. period. You, uh, you do less inversions, right? Um, yes. To reverse the blood flow during that cyclical, yeah. cyclical time. But there could be some other forms of this that we could incorporate into like the way we embody being in our cycle. So taking more time for rest, right? Your body does need it. It's doing such incredible work on the inside and it is so complicated and so beautiful. Like let it rest when it needs to rest. Listen to that inner body, that voice that says, hey, we need to slow down. Or, hey, I don't feel like going out. <laughs> or hey, I want something to eat. I want us to listen to those voices during this time period. I do a lot of um, bath rituals. Bath for me is very feminine energy. It's very restorative for me. So perhaps taking the time to self-care for us, right? Whatever it is that your body needs, that a bath is a beautiful ritual. I also like it because you can use transdermal mag in the bath. So I use like, you know, actual magnesium as well absorbed in our skin. So it's another mm -hmm. way to get that. But it's mm -hmm. another way to relax time out. Um, maybe being more attentive to our mindfulness during that time period, right? Um, allowing our meditation practice mm -hmm. to look different during this time period, allowing us to connect with our, you know, our, our tribe, our sisters, our friends, our mothers, our grandmothers, our children, our, our female tribe out there, because I think there is something in that wisdom of like being able to connect to each other as females, like all of the biological, you know, chemical, chemically female patients out there are going through similar experiences. So it is a good time to reach out and collaborate with your tribe, reach mm -hmm. out and lean on your tribe, right? Um, what other things do you recommend now for like kind of leaning okay. into this time period as a place of honoring mm -hmm. and embracing? Mm -hmm. Well, I would say definitely as soon as you start feeling a shift in your mood mm -hmm. to, to notice that, right? Mm -hmm to maybe notice that through meditation and sense like close your eyes and be with that emotion yeah. and not reject that. This is in general yeah. with emotion, but there's definitely more of a negative yeah. chain of thoughts when the, the PMS starts uh, or yeah. kicks, yeah. kicks in. So you want to do that even more because yeah. that negative thought, it's mostly... Well, it is related, as I said, energetically also to this inner work and ancestral work. There is, um, and also probably to the fact that as we're a little bit more tired and cravings, those are things that are a little bit against of what we feel society requires from that, that is being like always 100% and super energetic. And so that gap may make, may make us feel like, uh, that we're not good enough. And then that kind of chain of thought starts. So yeah. more awareness of that. And then, well, I like to, and that it depends on, um, on each person for sure. But I like to use, uh, like a diva cap or any other way to collect, uh, yeah. my period, mm -hmm. uh, or, and, or at least like, um, by, um, yeah, or organic, uh, mm -hmm. pads yes. or any, something organic or definitely I like the reusable um, diva cap yes. or the reusable underwear because that's also an important issue to mention. That's a lot of waste. Um, yes. Yeah. And I also remember reading that in the past women will offer the menstrual period to earth and yep. there is not to, to, to close the cycle, disconnection with earth, right? Because yep. we are made of earth and this goes back to earth apparently okay. by the way not all plants like in the amazon those yeah. plants don't want to be in, be near any of your menstrual cycle just <laughs> just letting you know if you want to go to do that practice be sure what plant yeah. but even if yeah. you don't do if you don't do that it yeah. like i don't do that um but like just be aware of the products that you use um, yes. in honoring Very mother earth that is also representing female energy as well. And as yes. female, we represent her at the same time. So keeping that in I mind. More than that, 
uh, not more than that, but equal to that, I think honoring our own earth, right? And our home here, mm -hmm. we want to be consciously using products that are safe and or whatever. Yes, also. We also want to use products that are safe for us. And there is a huge mm -hmm. amount of data out there that a lot of the you know, menstrual type products that we use, tampons, pads, are made from pretty toxic chemicals and or manufacturing processes. Mm -hmm. So I do encourage all my girls to be well informed and also be utilizing products that work for them. I can't tell you how many women I've seen have true allergies to some of the products that are being used in their pads, their tampons, I'm sure. causing mm -hmm. vaginal dysbiosis. They're ending up with vaginal infections frequently, mm -hmm. like low chemically treated process um, options. The Diva Cup is a great choice. They're usually made of silicone, which is typically more safe mm -hmm. than plastics. Um, it's for girls that can't use those options using, you know, organic and or um, cotton pads, reusable items that, but just do your research to find products that are good for earth, but also good for you because mm -hmm. you don't want to cause more problems. There's been found endocrine disrupting agents in these products. So we want to use low toxin agents for the earth, but also for our own home, this home mm -hmm. and that home. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a super important point, and I totally, a hundred emphatically agree with that. Absolutely. And then the last thing uh, which I love is uh, ceremonial cacao. Mm -hmm. um, it, that's beautiful. It, yes. So it's really like I use it also when not on my period, but it's definitely yeah. really good um, during your PMS or during your period uh, yeah. because. First of all, for the cravings, it's really calm the cravings, but also like helps you regulate the, your mood. Mm -hmm. And also it helps overall also a little bit less of pain. Uh, mm -hmm. By the way, maybe that could be another discussion because the okay. pain during the period, that's another uh, yeah. legit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think we can totally talk about that more. And I've got lots of really good tips and tricks that have worked. Um, and also some really you know non- pharmacological tips right because I, I mm. like I like a blend of both you know eastern and western and worldly um, options for girls but I like things that are easy and things that don't cause side effects um, so we could definitely touch on that too I think we could do a whole cycle um, content oh, but yes I know we're almost out of time today but what are our closing statements for today Mel oh as I said honoring your earth the earth in you and honoring mother earth honoring this motherhood energy in the planet yes. <laughs> yes i agree whether you're a mother or not it's honoring that like mothering energy the home energy right the home of this home but also the home of our, our earth we live in the home of being together i think is also kind of stands out to me like the home of like this kind of female tribe that we're all a part of right collectively amongst all of us in the world mm -hmm. um and I think the sentiment I'm left with is truly one of like celebratory nature of like, I think, you know, this consciousness, this time period we're coming into seems to have a bit more space for us women. And maybe it's because we've made that space. Maybe it's because of time. Maybe, I don't know. But I really enjoy seeing a different kind of framework surrounding women in general, the way we have cycles, the way we're different, right? It being celebrated and embraced versus it being like negative and kind of demeaned. Mm -hmm. So I just want to wish everyone the most wonderful month all about women. Um, all months are about you, just so you know. It's all the ladies, <laughs> to all the women who love ladies, to all the men who love ladies, to all of the ladies in all of your lives, right? Our mothers, our <laughs> yeah. grandmothers, our great grandmothers, our daughters, our sisters, our aunts, our friends, like all mm -hmm. the women out there, all of this collective tribe. I just wish you to embrace all of this femininity and leaning into our feminine energy as a strength, not as a weakness. Mm -hmm. That's so beautiful. So I just close with that. And thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Rachel. Everyone. Namaste.